Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, uh, today I'm going to be your professor, Ian Phillips, for the course Education 101. This is the fifth lecture in the series on everything to do with education, everything to do with teaching. Uh, and uh, today's lecture is going to be on technology in the classroom. Um, so before we get started, I just want to say timestamps will be in the description below. Uh, so do feel free to refer back to them at any moment or skip forward if you like. Uh, so timestamps are in the description below. Um, I do want to mention, though, uh, that we are going to do our little review. Uh, and so we'll spend a couple minutes talking about data-driven instruction from last week. And um, I also want to preface this by saying that I, I've, I wanted to do the lecture on stakeholder engagement first before this one. And so um, if this one comes out first, well, uh, I don't know. It was, just, it was just easier to do. And so the one on stakeholders is going to be a little bit more involved, a little bit more in-depth, trying to explain things with you know, the math behind the impact that you can make. Because um, people oftentimes think that they can make the biggest impact in the world concerning education. And you know, as one individual, um, that's just simply not the case. And uh, you, know, you could make a difference in somebody's situation, yes. But can you make a lasting impact that alters their innate proclivities enough so that they constantly uh, or continually engage in pro-social behavior. Now see, that's the question. And so, um, and the answer is no, you really can't unless you engage other stakeholders uh, throughout that process for a very long period of time. And then you can make a big difference, but until you engage all those stakeholders, well, look, you can't make the, the most monumental difference in the world. It's not going to be um, influencing their personalities by like 10, 20%. Like if somebody's um, extremely antisocial and they're on a, like a path towards like, um, you know, criminality, then look, I mean, there's not really much you're going to be doing here. You're talking half a percent maybe, right? But, you know, the hope is and the expectation is, is that you're engaging with everybody else for years on end and then you can teeter them over the line, right? And so, you know, the difference between pro-social um, behavior and antisocial behavior is, is, you know, it's pretty, like the line is close, right? Like you can just hop over one side or the other pretty quickly. And um, even if you think you can't, like you can. And so just getting them uh, pro-social enough is very, very vital and very, very important. And so um, we'll talk about that most likely in the next lecture. But maybe we'll talk, maybe it'll be the lecture before this one. And so, um, well, uh, so either way that's serving as a review or that is, uh, just telling you what's to come. So uh, do take that into consideration. Uh, now let's cover a brief review on data-driven instruction. Uh, what is data-driven instruction? Why is it important? And um, uh, should you be using it as a teacher? Well, data-driven instruction is the practice of using uh, data, which you oftentimes gather from assessment. You, everything that you do is you're assessing students. You're just staring at them, right? And you think that you're not doing anything. And, uh, and maybe they're not even doing anything. You're still assessing them. And we assess everybody all the time. You don't even got to be a teacher for this, right? Imagine that you're walking down the street, right? You're always assessing people. Because if you see somebody do something crazy, then you're walking away. You're going to the other side of the road, right? Like if somebody's just sitting there with like a baseball bat full of nails and they're just eyeing you down, right? Like you're going to notice, right? Um, or maybe they're walking and they drop their wallet. It's like you were assessing them, right? Because if something like that did happen, even subconsciously you're doing it, um, then you're going to... Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe alter your actions to uh, accommodate the situation. Well, teachers are no different, right? We're constantly collecting data, and that can be broken up into two different uh, portions, right? So you're constantly using this data to inform your decisions, right? But how do you collect it? Well, there's two different ways. There's one called formative assessment and summative assessment. Uh, formative assessment is really informal, um, so just observations as well as just like little worksheets, right? So it's not all encompassing of a unit or an objective uh, or a standard, um, unlike summative assessment. Um, but uh, it's a lot of just, but it can be a little bit more formal, right? So like a worksheet would be formative assessment, observations would be formative assessment, exit slips are formative assessments, uh, little projects would be a formative assessment, right? But then when you get to the to the bigger things, right, like a final exam, a midterm. Uh, a unit exam, uh, maybe like a, a nice big quiz. Uh, those are summative assessments, right? So it's trying to assess the amount of knowledge kids have in their totality uh, for a particular objective or standard. And so that's how you're collecting this data. And you want to use that data to inform your instruction, right? So you don't just want to teach randomly, right? And hope that students get it, right? Because that's just not, that's not the right way to be thinking about things, right? The way to be thinking about things is, look, if everybody understands it, you move on. If they don't understand it, you go back and you reteach it. 
or you clarify some things, right? So you don't just you don't just teach at a whim, doing whatever you want. You have to actually look at the data and how your students are responding to, responding to things. Uh, so if everybody does terrible on an exam and you tried a new teaching method, well then you probably don't need to do that teaching method again. And if you do, then you just have to alter the way in which it was implemented. Uh, and so these things are uh, very vital, um, these assessments, and uh, they're going to give you a lot of good information to alter your instruction. Um, another thing that we talked about too is, is that um, there's baselines to data, right? I mean, not, not everybody's going to have the highest scores out there, and it's unfortunate, right? Um, the analogy that I gave is like, look, you could put somebody in the best school in the country, right, and they, couldn't even, they wouldn't even teach, right? They would just sit there, and they wouldn't even teach the students at all, and the students would still score higher than most other schools in the state, right? And so, like, I mean, let's be honest here. Like, there's, there's going to be, like, some, you know, motivation uh, or elements that you just cannot simply control. Uh, there's going to be kids who just, you know, sometimes they're just coming in the classroom better, right? And um, they're also well, better in the sense that they're more motivated and also better in the sense that they're more prepared, right? Because think about it, right? Like, you're going to have kids all the time when you get into uh, being a teacher, right? And they'll be, you know, three, four, five grade levels behind. And, like, that's, that's normal, right? Like, I think the average reading level in the United States is about fourth grade. Right, and so the idea that like everybody's coming in prepared for all of these different grades, it's like that's just that is just so optimistic. But it, it, ignorance is bliss, right? And so maybe they just want to keep thinking that way, but that's just simply not how the world works. And so, you know, do take that into consideration. Uh, there's going to be different baselines, right? So, you know, uh, what is average at one school is going to be different than the average at another school. And that's not to say that you can't raise that average or that you shouldn't have extremely high expectations, right? But it is to say that you should not necessarily get um, upset with yourself or too sad if you're not achieving the highest scores in the state, right? But, I mean, I don't know, maybe not everybody wants to get the highest scores in the state, but that's what you should be striving for as a teacher, right? Um, you always want to have the highest scores possible. And, uh, but you just have to recognize that you might not always get there. And um, that's okay, right? As long as you're constantly pushing the envelope and just going higher and higher and higher. Even if that higher tends to plateau and you're just getting a tick higher every year, right? Some little tiny significant difference, right? Um, that's still better than nothing. And so, uh, well, that was data driven instruction. And so, uh, with that, we'll move on to technology in the classroom. Uh, why is it important? Its significance? Uh, how can you use technology as a teacher? And so, uh, you know, it's fairly straightforward here. Um, I think that technology is one of those things that uh, can really, really help you when you go into an interview. Because everybody, I don't know, in some regards, I feel like for a lot of people, it tends to be newer, right? Like people weren't using technology um, almost in any capacity, like you know, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, well, here we are now. And so, and I guess they were, right? But it was it was more limited, you know. I mean, you think back to the days of computer labs and whatnot, uh, but now we're talking post-COVID, every single like, student in the country has a laptop, their own personal laptop. And so, um, you know, times have certainly changed. And like, we knew that we were going in that direction for a long time. Um, the question was, when was it going to hit us? And, uh, you know, how can, and, and how vital is it going to become? Um, and it looks like nowadays it is extremely, extremely vital. Um, you don't have a choice but to engage with technology. And um, as a teacher, if you're not engaging with technology, not only are you doing a disservice to your kids, um, but you're also uh, doing a disservice to yourself, right? Because the administrators and the um, other staff members are going to look down on you if you're not using it. And uh, well, that's just something that you want to shield yourself from. Right? I mean, think about it, right? Like, if you're an administrator, right? Like, what do you want to see? Like, this, the, the teacher who's preparing uh, lessons, like, both online, maybe even uh, in person, or just, I don't know, I guess tangible. So something that's, I mean, online is tangible. So I guess this is sort of a tangent in itself. Wow, that's pretty interesting. I just used that word so many times. Um, but you know what I mean. Like, you have a paper copy, or do you want to have an online and a paper copy, or just do an online copy, right? Um, which one is the teacher, which one is the admin going to look more favorably on? They're going to look more favorably on the online copy um, as opposed to the uh, in hand copy. And uh, they're certainly going to look more favorably on somebody who does both. And uh, well, uh, you should always be striving to be that person, right? So if you're the, you're the teacher who never uses technology, uh, there's something to be said for that, right? And I, and, I, and I don't think that you necessarily need technology to teach. Right? I'm not in the belief that um, it's one of those things that uh, it's, it's just so, it's one of those things that you absolutely have to do, right? But the problem is, is that you, 
in the society that we live in, um, it's just better to do it than not. I don't know if that really makes sense, right? But let's, let's put it to you this way, right? You can become just as smart and just as educated, right, by reading books or um, having the teacher supply you with materials and whatnot. I mean, geez, a teacher could literally print a web page and get the same article and just give it to you in a paper copy. And actually, that paper copy is probably going to make kids behave a little bit better and pay more attention because they're not going to get distracted uh, by the Internet uh, you know, uh, search engines that are on their computer or the games or whatever, right? And so... Well, there's something to be said for that. Um, but in the same breath, uh, if you can use online, you're also fostering technical skills. And not everybody has access to these um, technologies uh, at their home. And so it's just a way to make learning a little bit more equitable for everybody. You want to you know, provide some quality of opportunity, or you want them to engage with some of these skills. And so that way, they, when they go to the job market, they're prepared. And uh, they have something that they can bring to the table. And so, while it's not necessarily vital for learning in of itself, I mean, people have been learning for thousands of years, and if you think for some reason they need technology in order to do so now, I mean, that's just ignorant. I mean, that's just not the case. I mean, you could just spend, um, you know, one of my uh, idols, uh, his name's Christopher Hitchens, and um, he died back in 2011, but uh, he always was terrible with the Internet. And uh, I remember it because I've watched, like, every interview this guy's, like, ever done, right? And um, he always mentioned, like, how he just, he, to the last moment, Right, he was using a typewriter until eventually started using like I think word processing or something on a computer, um, but you know I mean like dude you just read books you'll become smart right or you just you you, you can just do so many other things right without uh, f for learning as opposed to just using technology solely right um, but it is nice to integrate it into your lessons right so it's not necessarily mandatory for learning like some people might think, <coughs> um, but it is something that you have to do as a teacher. Uh, you're fostering those technical skills. You're, you're making learning a little bit more equitable. And uh, don't be scared of the word equity either because equity is just sort of like you're providing kids with what they need in order to uh, reach, I guess, just a general standard, right? So if somebody needs something a little bit more uh, than other kids, it's like that's fine, right? And the way I think about it in terms of technology and equity is that if you're a teacher, right, and you know somebody doesn't have access to technology, um, you could maybe do the exact same lesson um, in, you know, physical copies, or, or you could do the lesson uh, online. And this probably makes sense to do the lesson online in this case um, because, well, you know, not everybody has access to, te to that technology, and they, not everybody would be equally prepared then, right, because some kids might go home, they might play around with it for a little bit and uh, become acquainted with it, whereas other kids, they just don't have that opportunity. And so... Um, if you can give that to them in the classroom, that's something that's extremely vital. And, um, you know, times are changing now with COVID, like I mentioned, because, you know, oftentimes these teachers are, um, you know, given these laptops that they can give to their students, and then each student has their own individual personalized laptop. And so, you know, these skills are becoming more and more fostered by the day. Um, but as a result of that, and as a result of, of COVID, um, you have no choice but to engage with these technologies, and, and especially some of these um, ones that are a little bit more... Uh, um, Obscured, uh, they were that were a little bit more obscure to us uh, in the years prior to COVID, and not for everybody. I mean, like if you were a student, for example, you're always engaging with the learning management system, right? But if you're a, uh, but if you were like a teacher or like a student in the, in the, I mean, like a college student, like a tertiary education, higher education, that's when you were engaging with those learning management systems. Um, but nowadays, look, if you're a K through 12 student, now you're now you're definitely going to be engaging with them, right? Whereas that didn't exist before. And even if it did exist, it didn't exist in its full capacity. And so that was sort of like an individual teacher type uh, situation where hey, maybe they want to use Google, Google Classroom themselves and nobody's going to stop them, um, but it wasn't necessarily mandated. Nowadays, it's mandated. And so, or, you know, it's basically mandated. So having said that, uh, importance of technology um, well, we'll get to it. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can say about technology. It's, it's one of those things that is very uh, straightforward, but it has its talking points. And so uh, what is the importance of technology? Well, students get access away from school uh, to technology. And, you know, this is important for everybody uh, nowadays. And not every school allows kids to bring home their laptops, right? But oftentimes uh, they can. And uh, you can foster technological growth um, especially through individual inquiry, where kids are, you know, evaluating uh, questions themselves, right, for homework, for example, or they're finishing projects, and they're, and they're forced to learn these technological skills 
um, by themselves, right? And that's sort of how you grow in some regards. Like if I just tell you the answer to everything, right, and you don't put any effort forth yourself, um, then you're not really going to learn anything, right? Um, it's, it's no different than the, the old proverb where if you, <laughs> look, you teach a man to fish, right? And uh, eventually now he can feed himself, right? Well, it's the same kind of thing, right? And um, look, like I could be the teacher teaching somebody to, to do that, right? Um, but sometimes that can be difficult. And, um, but if you can uh, foster a situation where teachers are essentially forcing their students to learn themselves, Right, um, that can be a little bit better sometimes, and the reason for it is because they just well, they're going to have to be motivated. They don't have a choice but to learn it. Right, if I'm not there, they have to learn it. Right, whereas if I am there, maybe they learn it, maybe they don't. Right, and so you just got to be thinking about these things. Um, so access away from school, um, pretty important. I, I and also too like, look, it's it's a it's a research tool, right? So it goes in with the next point, right? Um, you can do research from home. They don't got to wait till they come back to the classroom. And uh, I'm not a big fan of homework, by the way. I don't think that there's much evidence to suggest that kids should be doing homework. In fact, I think the school days should be shorter. Um, I don't believe that they should be as long as they are. Uh, you know, seven, eight hours, I think that's pretty ridiculous, in my opinion, for kids. Now, once they get a little older, right, and they get to high school, now we can talk about a longer day, that's fine. Um, but when, you, when you're younger, you know, I think elementary school to middle school, um, or however you want to, you know, qualify that, right, so what is the cutoff, um, I don't think that the day should be as long. Now, they should still go to school every day and still have some hours in, um, but I also think the curriculum should be structured differently as well. So these are whole other conversations, but um, look, research purposes, right, you can do so much um, at your home and uh, that's a great thing. So anyways, research purposes, um, now we're just going to talk about it in its totality here. So um, if you're in the classroom and you're doing some projects, you're engaging with project-based learning, it's one of the things we talked about on our lecture on differentiation, um, students are going to have the ability to uh, research questions. They're going to be able to inquire about things and look up the answers uh, to their inquiries. And um, they're also going to be able to uh, research the questions that you are posing to them and uh, come up with uh, solutions as a result of that, um, or they can communicate their findings to their peers. And so research is very vital, and, and nowadays it's, it's, it's very interesting actually, because you'll even look at like full-grown adults, and this is just such like a, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's just the people that I associate myself with, and, and I think that's obviously part of it, right, where, you know, everybody that I'm surrounded with, it's like, look, we're all relatively motivated, um, we all are engaged, we're using technology all the time, we practically live on it, right? But we don't use technology only for our own leisure. We don't use technology solely to, as an indulgence, right? We're using technology um, for growth in some regards, right? Or to look up uh, answers to questions. And uh, students aren't familiar with that at all. And, um, you know, why should they be, right? Like if they're young, um, yeah, they haven't had any experience using things like Google, for example, right? But even adults, right? You'll notice they're absolutely terrible at looking things up. and um, well, I, I think some people are afraid of using technology, right? So they just never, they just never delve into it because they don't want to have that learning curve. And um, I don't really understand that personally because, well, I'm a very open individual. I'm one of those people who loves to try new things. But um, for a lot of people, that simply isn't the case. And so especially your older generations, it's like, look, I mean, the stereotype is relatively true. They're pretty bad with technology, right? So they're, they suck at looking things up, right? Whereas you have... Um, you know, the younger crowds, the younger and younger, they become more familiarized with technology and they're more um, apt to uh, adopt it and, and, and learn how to use some of these uh, tools that are at their disposal. And so, you know, research purposes, though, it, it is extremely vital. So that way they, they, people aren't ending up um, illiterate in terms of technology and they can actually look up uh, questions that they have and find the answers, right? And do so in an effective manner, too. And... Um, I think some of the curriculum uh, is pretty good nowadays uh, for getting students to foster critical thinking, right? And, and now, there is a I think that there should be a debate behind can you foster critical thinking because I don't think that there's almost any evidence at all um, that you can increase critical thinking. And, and what I mean by that, is, and you can, but it, it's very um, surface level in some regards, right? Um, and so. Uh, I've studied the, the literature on uh, intelligence for quite some time now, so for, so for many, many years. And um, you know, it appears to me that it is absolutely impossible to increase intelligence. And if you can figure out how to do so, uh, you will be a multi-billionaire. Nobody's figured out how to do it yet. Um, it's not something that you can uh, easily do. And, and so 
well, having said that, though, you can increase intelligence a little bit, right? But it plateaus, right? And you can't move somebody past their plateau or their base or their their um, maximum in potential intelligence, right? So if somebody's maximum potential is 110, you will never get them above 110 IQ, right? Um, or 95 IQ, whatever it is, right? You're not going to get them above that maximum threshold, right? Um, but you can uh, easily. Right, tear down their intelligence, right? So, you know, you just don't feed somebody and starve them, right, when they're young. It's like, yeah, you just wreck their intelligence, right? Um, but you can do a lot of different things, right? Uh, to, well, you don't give anybody any access to education, right? It's like, look, they're not going to be intelligent, right? And, like, I don't know why that's controversial to say sometimes, right? People don't like the concept of intelligence. Um, the way I was always told, it's like people, they're not necessarily upset with the idea that people can be smart, but they're upset with the idea that people cannot be smart. And so, or not be intelligent. And so, because smarts and intelligence are two different things, right? And so, um, like, you can be uh, in intelligent but not be smart, right? But you can be uh, smart and not be intelligent, right? So there, there is a difference there. Um, but having said that, uh, anyways, one of the things that I was looking up when I was, uh, uh, was uh, intelli increasing intelligence, right? And, and it turns out that you just simply cannot do, no matter what intervention you put forth, um, games don't work to increase intelligence. Any of those brain games, those don't work. Um, any like nutritional uh, supplement or anything, those don't work. Um, you can't just take some pill like it's limitless um, with Bradley Cooper. It's one of my favorite movies, by the way. And um, just automatically increase your intelligence a whole bunch. Uh, it turns out that um, there's nothing that you can do. And the idea of critical thinking is that you're always, you're critically evaluating something, right? So you're looking at it from multiple angles. And people who are intelligent tend to do that a little bit more often than people who are less intelligent. Right? And I think that's correlated with the, the trait, the personality trait, openness to experience, where people are just willing to engage with uh, new ideas a little bit more often um, than people who are uh, a little bit less intelligent, right? And it just sort of comes natural, right? Because if you're a little bit more intelligent, right, you're going to learn something faster, and you're always going to be able to, you're going to be able to explore things quicker, and um, you'll be able to reason a little bit better about why something may be uh, better even if it's conflicting with the, the current uh, state of affairs or the current narrative that is being portrayed um, well in, in whatever domain. And so having said that, um, intelligence uh, and critical thinking to me go hand in hand, right? Like if you're critically assessing something, like the people who are more intelligent are just simply going to do it better. Um, but, but there are ways to foster critical thinking in the sense that if you ingrain it in somebody enough to where you say, look, you have to question everything. And again, you're not going to be able to foster this as one individual teacher, right? So it becomes a thing with uh, stakeholders where you have to engage people over time, right, for a very long period of time to always be questioning things. And this is extremely important in today's society. I mean, just look at the media that we have nowadays um, in any country, but especially the United States. I mean, it's absolutely horrendous. I mean, people fall victim to its ideology every single day. And um, uh, God, I, I can't, that's a whole other conversation, right? Um, but, you know, people, they get very uh, held and steadfast with their beliefs. Um, but that's just simply not the, it's not the solution, not the answer. The people should evaluate things critically on every single topic, on every single issue, and they shouldn't just take the word of some giant media company that has its, its vested interest. And that's one of the big things with the social studies, and I'm a social studies teacher, and so for me, um, I think that that oftentimes is one of the um, key things that we're trying to foster as a social studies teacher um, is this sense of critical thinking and evaluating sources, right? Because, look, everybody has a different interpretation of history, right? But which one um, is the... But we don't even want an interpretation of history necessarily. We want um, just the hard facts, and so that way you can make your own interpretation of things, right? Because um, we don't want you to just be a mindless drone, right? And just, and just listen to what somebody has to say and then take that up as your own ideology, right? Like even people I, I really agree with, for example, it's like, look, I critically evaluate what they're saying, and um, I come up with my own uh, perspective on things. And that's what we want with our students, right? And so this is going to support uh, inquiry. It's going to support critical thinking using technology because you're giving them those skills uh, to answer these questions and evaluate their sources. They know not to just click on the first link 
because um, that first link has bias perhaps, right? It's a promotion link on Google. Somebody paid money for you to see it. Why do they pay money? They didn't do it just because they're trying to be nice. Maybe they are trying to be nice. That's, so that could be the case, right? But most of the time they're trying to make money off of you and they're trying to um, trick you into paying them. And so look, that's the promotion tweet. Then you go down, right? What are some of the first ones that go down, right? These big media companies. Uh, and so they got a lot of traction. Now, why do they have a lot of traction? Well, look, they appeal to people's interest. I get it. Um, but in the same breath, uh, maybe that's not always the right answer. Maybe you can even get um, some sources that people just wouldn't consider uh, academic or credible. And uh, people have to be able to know how to evaluate these things. Like if it's just like, like uh, some discussion board, for example. And um, there's a whole bunch of ranging opinions on things and people who are saying, uh, have, having conflicting uh, thoughts on a certain issue with conflicting facts for that matter. Kids have to be able to realize that that's the case and not just take the first thing that they said and then try to communicate to others because um, then you're just spreading misinformation. And so, you know, it's a very complicated issue and you spend a lot of time doing that in social studies, evaluating sources, what type of source it is. Obviously, primary sources are the best types of source. Uh, and then you want to work into secondary sources, um, which can also be extremely valuable. And so, uh, anyways, it's going to research purposes, supporting inquiry. They're getting, they're having the ability to question things and uh, find the answers to those questions. Um, and then we got uh, feedback at fingertips, right? So if you're a teacher and uh, you want to, um, and so technical skills, we already sort of covered technical skills, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. But feedback at fingertips, right? So this is for the teachers, right? Actually, let's do technical skills first. All right, so technical skills, uh, that would be anything from typing all the way to looking up information, uh, to constructing things such as PowerPoints, right? Or sharing information for that matter online. So you're sending an email back and forth. You're using Google Drive. Uh, you're creating, you know, video, doing video production. You're creating songs, right? You're doing uh, as much as you can with technology, right? You're creating little, uh, little diagrams and pictures um, to represent certain concepts. Uh, and then you can use that technology to even communicate with people who are in person, right? So obviously you got your PowerPoints, um, you got your Word documents, you can write your essays on there so you can become more familiarized uh, with things such as like spell check and whatnot. And so I'm um, just correcting you as you type, which is a good thing for kids, right? Because they're getting that instantaneous feedback um, on everything that they write. And so uh, you know, it'll help out with their grammar and whatnot. Um, but it'll also make things a little bit more professional, right? Because if you're a, a student, um, like what, are you going to handwrite your essay? No. Right? You're going to go to Word and you're going to type it up, right? Because nobody's reading a handwritten uh, resume, and that's even if it's a good resume, they're still not going to read it. And uh, maybe you'll have some people who, you know, they're trying to give somebody a chance and maybe help them out, and that's awesome, right? But that's just not the way the world works in most cases, right? Again, um, it try to, it, it, you got to get back to uh, some stereotypes, right? Um, not everybody's going to recognize some inequities that are in the world, right? So maybe they don't even have access to a computer or whatnot, but it's like, you know what, they kind of do, right? Because they can go to the library and they can print out their resume. And so, well, there's that. Um, but also, too, like, again, imagine this, right? Imagine that you're a business owner, right? And, like, I think I mentioned this in the first lecture. So let's say you want to open a McDonald's, right? It's like, how much do you think it costs to open a McDonald's, right? A McDonald's, how much does it cost? $2 million liquid net worth, right? So you just threw $2 million on the table, um, over, not even on the table, over a fire, right? And if you don't put all the effort that you can, that money's going to burn away, Right, it's going to disintegrate. And so you got to get all your workers to pull the rope right, as hard as they possibly can and get that money away from the fire right, and back into your pockets. Now, are you going to take the worker who doesn't even know how to do um, the most basic uses of technology? And maybe it's not even relevant to the job, right, but it just shows you that they probably weren't uh, paying much attention when they were in school. And it shows you that they don't have the initiative or the um, wherewithal to do their research to show that, look, they shouldn't have done a handwritten resume. And um, it should be very, 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 very professional, especially in this competitive job market. And so, um, look, these things are, you know, people got a lot on the line, right? And they want to see these skills, and um, they're only going to hire the best, right? And that's sort of the way the, the free market works in some regards. And that's not always the case, right? Um, because there is something known as nepotism, where uh, people will just hire their friends or uh, people that they know. And uh, that happens a lot more than people like to think. Um, 70, 80% of the people who are hired are hired through nepotistic means. And uh, people don't like that fact, um, but that's simply the way the world works. There's a great saying uh, that says, who you know is where you go. 
And uh, people need to become more familiarized with that because that just shows you that not everything is merit-based, right? Because if we lived in a merit-based society, look at the people who run the government, for example. And that'll just, we'll just say that, right? It's not a merit-based society um, or solely a merit-based society. Though, there is room for growth. Like, if you're a smart individual in the society, it's like it's better to be alive, or a smart individual, it's better to be alive now than it ever was in human history, right? Uh, because you can rise up. There's less barriers for you to do so based on social class and, and um, race or gender. And, uh, you know, these things are always a constant battle, um, but it's now the best time in history to have lived, right? Even better than 10 years ago. I mean, uh, geez, even like 10 years ago, I'm pretty sure, uh, what was it? I've, uh, let's see, gays couldn't marry 10 years ago. Um, transgenders are still banned from the military. Or I think they were recently reinstated. Um, you know, and that's just in the United States, right? And then you got to deal with um, all the race issues. So let me just go back. I mean, they didn't really get full rights until like the 1970s, right, at the least. Um, and so, you know, then you had to deal with all the racism that was still um, in the aftermath of that. And so, like, you know, these things, are, fighting for rights is constant, right? Um, atheists, for example, on the religious front, right? Um, they have faced a, a whole range of discrimination, right? And now they're growing in population, you know, probably because people more, feel more comfortable to say they're an atheist, right? Um, I saw this wonderful uh, thing the other day where there was a, uh, there was a graph, right? And it was showing the, it was somebody trying to just uh, uh, make, so people were making, so a conservative was making the case um, that uh, it is culture that is influencing people to um, come out as LGBTQ. And uh, this other person was making the case that it was, um, uh, that it is just a more safer accepting society and therefore people feel more comfortable to come out as LGBTQ. And um, uh, one of the reasons that they were saying that was like, look at left-handedness. Left-handedness used to be treated as uh, this thing where you're almost like, you know, a spawn of Satan in some regards, right? Where it's very taboo to come out as left-handed. And uh, eventually when left-handedness became more accepted, uh, in society, and there was less uh, repercussions for being left-handed. Uh, well, then all of a sudden, the population of people left-handed skyrocketed, right? And you know, it would mirror the same uh, trends that are going on uh, culturally. And so, it, it is a constant battle, right? So you always have to be fighting for your rights, moving forward as a society. And uh, one of the ways you can do that is through the use of technology. And um, if you're not using technology uh, properly and and uh, using it as a tool for learning, as opposed to just a tool for uh, leisure, well. It's going to get uh, very difficult to move forward as a society and uh, come to some of the uh, better conclusions that you know, we have been in, in recent years where um, people are moving forward in terms of their uh, acceptance of others uh, as well as um, you know, just a quality of opportunity, which is uh, beneficial to everybody, I might add. Right? So it's important that everybody has an opportunity to uh, be who they truly want to be. Right? It sounds cliche, right? but this benefits everybody. Right? Like if you've got somebody who really wants to be something the best at it, right? you don't want to bar them from doing so um, just simply as a result of, say, the color of their skin um, or their sexual orientation uh, or their uh, religious beliefs. Right? You want to uh, hire them for who they are and, uh, you know, as uh, an individual right? and what you know, they themselves can bring to the table. And so you know, we're moving forward as a society. And uh, one of the ways that we can uh, help continue that trend is through technology. And uh, on the, the nepotism side of things, uh, maybe that won't go away anytime soon. But, um, well, uh, the best we can hope for is that we strive towards a more merit-based society. And uh, we've got to give these kids uh, the tools so that way they can be competitive in this merit-based society. Right, because the last thing that you want is for them to go into the job market and they're not prepared. Right? And then you did them a disservice. Right? So you've got to give them these skills. Right? Uh, anyways, uh, we'll move on here. So feedback at fingertips. Uh, for a teacher, it's extremely important that you're constantly providing feedback all the time. Right? It's something that you want to uh, continually give students. And we talked about this in the data-driven instruction uh, assessment and grading lecture, uh, where feedback is absolutely vital. That's one of the main components of effective grading. Right? Grading is not just to give people a grade. Right? You have to give them feedback to tell them why they got that grade and how they can improve moving forward so that way they can develop a plan based on their own personal reflection, the reflections of the teachers or the comments of the teachers, um, in order to better their situation moving forward. And so feedback is absolutely vital. And um, one of the ways that it's made easier through technology is that teachers
teachers can just upload it online quickly. And so they can quickly grade something right away, and students can see their grades. So they don't have to come up to the teacher and be like, hey, can I see my grade? Right? Because one, the teacher gets annoyed by that, right? And if they say that they don't, they do get annoyed by it. And so um, if it's just like a constant thing, it's like, um, but that problem can be solved um, if they would just upload their grades to a learning management system. And then the problem mysteriously goes away. And so uh, now the kids can just know to go onto Canvas or Google Classroom or Schoology or PowerSchool or, or whatever, Blackboard, right? And then they home access, right? There's no shortage of these learning management systems, right? And then they can access the grades themselves and see how they're performing and know how they need to uh, tailor their motivation to um, work hard in the class so that they can get the grade that they desire. And so, um, one, it saves time and effort, right, just putting it online. Uh, you can give quick grading, and you can also type things faster. Like, is it easier to just, um, well, in some regards, it's easier to just mark a paper, right? Like, if you got to spell out things like for grammar and whatnot, it's easier to just do it with pen than it is just writing. Um, but if you have to give any more detailed feedback, such as on extended response questions on, say, like a quiz, for example, um, well, so I, I find it to be a little bit easier just typing things. I can, I can type extremely, extremely fast. Um, and so, well, feedback at fingertips, uh, that's very important. Uh, then you got a, a lesson construction. Uh, so this is one of the, the newer things that's coming uh, to play here. And, and people have to... They got to jump on this bandwagon here. And there, there's not necessarily a need for most people. Um, if you want to spend the money or you want to spend the time, but if you don't want to spend the money and you don't want to spend the time, um, then one of the ways that you can construct uh, lessons is through artificial intelligence. And uh, you can also do so just looking things up online and getting uh, lessons from other people. Right? So you can just type in, like, I don't know, American Revolution PowerPoint, and there'll be like 50 PowerPoints that come up. And uh, then you can even like refine it, so, like American Revolution PowerPoint High School. Right? And then you'll get a, a nice PowerPoint. And um, then you can edit it yourself a little bit to include what you need to, alter it to your standards, um, and make it a little bit more age appropriate uh, if you need to. And so, or just you know, relevant to your students, for that matter, and more engaging and interesting. And so there's uh, no shortage of ways to do that. Right? But if you have to construct everything yourself, so that's going to get pretty difficult pretty quickly. And uh, you might be able to do it for a time, but eventually you're going to get burnt out. And um, if you get burnt out, then you're not going to put effort in other uh, towards um, effort uh, in other domains, and you're not going to be as productive of a teacher, or as effective for that matter. Uh, as, productive, uh, as productive of a teacher, or as effective. And so, uh, lesson construction, uh, you can use uh, artificial intelligence, and we'll look at a, 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 a big packet that I made that is strictly made from artificial intelligence. And it's pretty cool nowadays. Um, you guys have heard, obviously heard of ChatGPT, uh, how it's taking over the world, and I was one of the people who um, immediately, as soon as it started blowing up, I, I got on ChatGPT3 and I was like, wow, you know what, I can make some lessons for my students just using artificial intelligence. And it's kind of cool, right? Because they, you know, you tell them, it's like, hey guys, by the way, this wasn't even made by me, this was made by a computer. And they're like, what? This was made by a computer? I'm like, yeah, this is, this is made by a robot. Um, or I don't even know if you consider ChatGPT a robot. I guess you wouldn't consider it a robot, but artificial intelligence, right? So uh, lesson construction, pretty cool, and uh, you know, can aid in that process. You're researching things, right? You're getting uh, materials from other uh, sources, and you're, making the, you're, you're bringing them into the fold in your own classroom. And uh, well, lesson construction, I think that's pretty important. I mean, you can also just use software to make the lessons, right? So you're, you're using the worksheet, you're making it online so that we can print it out to everybody else, right? So you're constantly using technology all the time, and uh, you should never not be using it. All right, so when do you use it, right? To support and enhance learning, right? And do not use it if, it is, if there is a chance it will be a detriment, right? So, uh, or something that's negative. A detriment is like a negative. Um, so to support and enhance learning. Now, you can use uh, technology just for something that could easily be done uh, via pen and pencil, uh, pen and paper, or pencil, paper, whatever you want to define it as. Uh, but when you have the opportunity to, um, you can support the learning with technology for like its own individual project or worksheet or whatever. Uh, but you can also enhance it by just simply giving them an alternative. So if they don't want to do something by hand on paper, you can allow them to do it online. And uh, there's ways to do that. Let's say, for example, you want to have them assess a writing prompt in class, and that's their bell work. Well, they can either do the bell work online, or they can do the bell work via pen and paper. 
And so there's uh, ways in which you can, you can provide them some opportunity to engage in their own interest, right? Um, in the sense that they can use the medium that they are most comfortable with uh, and, well, foster their own growth. And so that's something that you can do. Um, you can also, again, enhance it even farther with more differentiation tactics, too, when you're using technology, right? So instead of just uh, giving them a writing prompt online, you could have them do a discussion post, right? And, and then maybe make it a little bit more opinionated, right? So that way uh, they have to use facts and whatnot um, to arrive at their conclusions, but they, they can put forth their own opinions on things. So that's uh, pretty important as well, um, or their own take on things. So. Uh, to support slash enhance learning, uh, don't, don't use it if it's going to be a detriment. Don't, don't, don't just use technology just to use it. Um, there has to either be, you know, there can't be a potential for negative um, effect of technology, right? And what I, what I mean by that, right? Well, technology can be very distracting. And um, technology oftentimes uh, is not always the, the best medium because, well, kids just don't use it properly, right? And so you, when you use it, you want to make sure it's more structured until they eventually are comfortable enough that they can use it for certain assignments. And so um, let's say that we are, uh, well, I had this one, this one situation before in the past, um, and I can't remember what it was. We were learning about vaccines, right, because we're learning about viruses. And um, uh, I was like, all right, well, who is uh, Edward Jenner? Right, he's the, the guy who made the vaccines, and they should have known who that was because we watched a video on him, right? But for some reason, everybody just forgot. And they just typed in on Google who was Edward Jenner, right? And they just completely, everybody like failed it besides like one person, right? I'm just like, because they weren't using, they weren't, first of all, they weren't even reading what they um, were looking up on Google, right? And so you had to like, <laughs> so you just had to like tell them, it's like, guys, like, what are we doing here? Like, we, one, we went over the answer, right? So you guys should be turning in another copy because I allow them to turn to work late and uh, trying to get some more points from that too. But nobody did that, right? But then you get to, um, just, just grading in general, the original prompts themselves and the original hand-ins. And you're like, what on earth, man? Because they just they were, when they weren't reading what they were looking up, right? And they weren't evaluating sources effectively for anything that was even relevant, right? So they're just finding some other random Edward Jenner, not the Edward Jenner that was creating the vaccines. And, um, well, it comes to bite them, right? So don't use it if it's going to be detriment, right? Uh, and that can be different for, um, uh, you know, different situations. But if it's like in the notes, for example, Maybe you don't want them to use technology, right? Maybe they can just evaluate uh, the text that they have right in front of them, right, and uh, construct meaningful answers or responses uh, to whatever your prompt is, right? So you could say, all right, using the terms uh, evaporation, condensation, and precipitation, uh, and um, let's say uh, surface runoff and groundwater, uh, construct a paragraph on the journey of a water droplet. Right in the water cycle, right, and so you know you're making it some higher order thinking, right? They got to be able to synthesize something, um, but they're also uh, able to look at their text, right, that they have in front of them. So they don't even need technology to do this, right? They can just simply read what they have, interpret it, and then put it down, synthesize it into something new. And so that's you know you don't need technology to do that, right? So if it could be a detriment that they get confused using the technology, right? Because what's going to happen is they're going to type in that exact prompt. Right? And nothing's going to come up that's relevant, and they're going to write down what they find. Right? And so that's a detriment at that point. And you have to be willing to accept that, that it's not always applicable to your situation. And so you know, take these things uh, you know, in terms of your own students, right? and so personalize them. Um, you want to make sure that your students would benefit. Maybe they wouldn't. So it really depends on your own student uh, body that you have. But you got to know who they are. Right? So you got to use the data in order to come to those decisions. Uh, so how do you implement this? Well, simply put as much as possible. Uh, on a learning management system, right? That's a great way to do it, right? So you're giving them the option to always do things online um, or just use resources that are online, right? And use that on their learning management system because, you know, a lot of kids are going to have to use these systems when they get to college. Not everybody um, is going to go to college, but for the people who do go to college, and I think, like, what is it now? Like, only, like, 30% of people graduate from college anyways, and so even if more people are going, most people aren't going to graduate. And so, you know, it's not important to foster for everybody. More... Uh, career skills or um, talking about options for potential future careers are uh, important to talk about for students because most students aren't going to go to college. And um, even if students go to college, uh, most of them don't even find a job in their field. And of the ones that do find a job in their field, they don't have a job uh, actually doing what they want. They only have a job in their field. So they could just be doing something completely different than what they originally expected to do. And so, you know, extremely uh, 
uh, narrow in some regards, right? Just even the process of using learning management system, but it gets them acquainted with technology and just basic skills are things that we need to foster, right? So just, just becoming familiarized with even typing, for instance, right? Um, it it's, looks much better if you're at the job and you gotta type something and you're going like this as opposed to just going like tick, 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 tick with your fingers. And so, um, well, to simply, uh, <laughs> So use as much as possible learning management systems and also create some other little things too, like PDFs, for example, is a great thing. Um, they click a PDF, they know how to open it, they know how to download something, they know how to save a picture, they know how to um, use spell check or Word or whatever is on the learning management system or, yeah, like, like a spell check that's on the learning management system. And so, uh, yeah, so learning management system, that's an easy way. Um, allow them to use it to conduct research, which we already talked about a little bit. Um, they have to be conducting research uh, using uh, online resources um, better than flipping through books, although I recommend students go through books nowadays. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit antiquated in that regard, but I think uh, it's a lost skill nowadays. You know, it's kind of like cursive, right? I mean, nobody can read cursive because we stopped teaching it for a while, right? But it's like, look, there's a lot of documents, and as a um, you know, historian and somebody who uh, teaches history, um, People have to be willing to, uh, to uh, they have to be able to read these sources in order to, to uh, interpret them and evaluate them. And so they don't have that skill. Uh, that's not something that's going to be uh, beneficial to them. Or maybe an old uh, source like a book, for example, uh, that you can find like at the library, some old books. Um, if they can't uh, know how to effectively search through text, right, um, or how to do that, they're going to have a difficult time, especially if it's not online. Um, if, if, they've, if they're only familiar with online, how to do that, they're not going to be able to do it in person. So, like, how would you do that, right? You look at the table of contents, right? And then you go to it, and then you, like, you can skim by, like, the subheadings and whatnot until you eventually find exactly what you need to. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. It seems like an easy skill, something easy, that you can easily teach, um, but we're not teaching it anymore. And so, uh, if you're not teaching it, well, then you need to have a mix so that way they can uh, do both and, and um, well, be the most prepared they possibly can be. So, you know, use it to conduct research, though. Uh, it is very important, right, just in any capacity. Um, and it is something that we should be fostering the majority of the time. So the majority of the time, they should be doing this on technology. And then uh, next up, to make learning fun. To make learning fun. So one of our differentiation uh, tactics was games. Uh, games are a great way to use technology. I use games all the time in my classroom. When I use games, I use them for Look It, uh, Kahoot, uh, for really just the teaching of facts. Uh, so you're looking at not teaching concepts, teaching rote memorization, right? And then, then hopefully that rote memorization, they can interpret everything that they learned and uh, come to reasonable conclusions about the concepts themselves um, or understand them enough uh, to pass a test uh, or just become familiarized with the concept, right? Because, you know, learning is about more than necessarily state test. And so, uh, well, yeah, to make learning fun. Um, the best one I've ever found was, and I, I think this is, this ties in very good with the literature um, on like just games in general and play, is uh, the, the, the program called Blook It. And Blook It, I use it all the time in my classroom. It's basically you can take, let's say you just, you make the Blook It, right? And it's multiple choice everything, right? So you give them a question, right? And then you do A, B, C, or D, but it's like color, coordinate, color coordinated. And... Um, well, they can just learn these concepts quickly, right? But they're not, just, they're not just going through the game, right, trying to earn points, right, when they're answering these questions right. They're competing with other people, right? And there's options to uh, even steal points from other people, right? So it's a very competitive game, and uh, there is some fluctuation about the, from the people who are at the top. Now, if you're, like, the brightest student in the class, it's like you're going to have a much higher chance of staying at the top than you would if you were uh, less bright. But um, the thing is, is that... Uh, it gives those people who are constantly at the bottom an opportunity to get to the top, and they're able to um, they're able to just become more engaged with the game, right? Because if you're constantly at the bottom and you always lose all the time, you're going to be unmotivated to continue. Uh, whereas if you have the opportunity to win uh, every once in a while, even if it's only for a small brief moment, you're in the lead. Um, it's going to keep them more interested in the game, and uh, you know they might not be in the lead every game, um, but you know they have the opportunity to be. Right, and so I think there was some research on uh, rats, right? And um, rats, when they play with each other, right? The, uh, if if one rat, you know, pins another rat down the majority of the time, <coughs> and doesn't let the other rat win at all, the other rat's going to become disinterested. It's not going to want to play. Um, but if the uh, like the bigger rat that's always pinning down the smaller rat 
um, lets itself be pinned down every once in a while, then they can engage in meaningful play. And play is very important for development. Um, kids, when they're younger, should be playing all the time, right? We really shouldn't even have curriculum and instruction, uh, really, for the first few years of their education, honestly. It should, I mean, like you should, right? But it should be very minimal, right? It should be a lot of etiquette and um, uh, just very basic learning and skills. Um, and then they should engage with others, learn how to socialize properly, pro social behavior, interact in a in a positive, meaningful manner um, that does that is not uh, conducive to antisocial behavior, and um, like why is that important, right? Like why should you be focused more so on uh, mitigating antisocial behavior than uh, learning about multiplication, right? It's like well, uh, yeah, you'll eventually learn multiplication, right? Or like you know, long addition or something. I don't know what, but uh, when they learn that, but um, you know, the reason it's more important is because you have um, well. Students are, you have the situation nowadays where people are falling victim to a society that is not training them how to be pro-social. And uh, that sort of falls into the hands of the parents nowadays, and especially in the United States. And so maybe it's different elsewhere. Um, but one of the problems with that is not every parent cares about their kids necessarily, right? And so um, they'll just leave their kids off to the wolves and their kids come back and they're extremely antisocial uh, by the time they get to school and they just, you know, they do things that are not going to be conducive to healthy uh, relationships uh, in, in, in society. And so, you know, one of the things that I noticed was for behavior right away is that kids, they're not necessarily evil. When they do something that's bad, they, it's not necessarily because they're trying to be evil. They're doing something that's bad um, because they're attempting to engage in play, right? So when little Jimmy walks over and uh, punches Jessica like this, or little Jimmy punches Alex like this, just punches him, right? Like, they, like he's punching him, right, because he's trying to play with him. But he doesn't know how to play, right, because he's unsocialized. He doesn't understand that that's not something that you can just do in society, right? And so, um, well, then you become up with problems, right? And so maybe little Alex is fine with that, because he's unsocialized too, right? But maybe he punches Jessica, and Jessica's not okay with that, right? Because she doesn't want to play in that regard. She has rules and structure that she wants to abide by, right? You don't hit people when you play, right? And so, well, then there's going to be a, a disconnect. There's going to be a bridge, right? They're going to, there's going to be separation. They're not going to want to play with each other ever again, um, or maybe sparringly. Um, and so, uh, you know, there'll be, and so what happens is, is over time, the pro-social kids and the anti-social kids segregate themselves from one another. And so the anti-social kids play with the other anti-social kids, the pro-social kids play with the other pro-social kids. And then um, there'll be like a big mix in the middle, of course, right? Um, but the line is, you know, it's pretty, you can step over one side or the other pretty quickly. And um, these influences are going to cause people to go back and forth um, between that line um, about what is generally accepted as, as pro-social or sociable. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, Teaching these skills is absolutely vital when they're, when they're younger, and um, games is, is great for that. Uh, you can teach people to play in a nice, respectful manner, um, so you can foster skills even at a higher level. Um, but then, you know, just in general, these games, they allow people to come out on top sometimes. And so, uh, anyways, that was a little bit of a tangent. Um, games are fun. Games should be used, right? Everybody loves games, and uh, if you're not using them, then you should be considering why you're not, not using them and uh, really trying to bring them into the fold in your classroom. And, in, and another thing I want to mention, too, is that you know, it's not necessarily that the parent doesn't care about their kid, right? And so I shouldn't necessarily say that, right? But, but what happens is the parent themselves are antisocial, right? And so they, they don't know how to raise their kid in a pro-social manner. And um, even if they do... Then it comes back to the lack of, uh, well, caring in the sense because they already are antisocial and so they don't care about these pro-social uh, norms, right? So I guess I did have it right the first time. Um, and, you know, think about it this way, right? Like, they might front and say, hey, look, like, it's, it's not okay for them to be swearing, right? But then they don't do anything about their kids swearing in class, right? And so, well, does that mean that they care? To me, it means that they don't care. And um, even if they, they say that they're trying something, then they're not trying hard enough, right, to try to mitigate that behavior, right? Because there has to be, uh, you know, some consequence, or they have to sit down with their kid and say, look, this is not okay. But most parents don't do that. And um, they just expect the teacher to do it in some regards. And so, 
you know, the teacher is uh, like, a, like a parent in some regards because they got responsibility over the kid for like an hour a day, right, if you're in, uh, you know, the middle school or high school level. And so um, in some regards, like, they are like a parent, right, for at least the first, for like an hour a day. Um, but they also don't have um, the capacity to act as a parent, right, because parents, they have a diff completely different role, I guess, in, in some regards. And so, um, but, you know, there is some overlap there. And so we're trying to teach them to be better members of society. But if their, their parents aren't doing that eight hours a day when they're at home with them, um, and then on the weekends, too, it's like, well, then, look, you're going to have a difficult time uh, trying to, you know, mitigate that antisocial behavior. And so, um, anyways, that's a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. You know, I'm obviously willing to answer any questions in the comments, but um, I think that we should move on. And so games, very important. And, uh, you know, especially games that allow students to come out on top sometimes. So do take that into consideration. All right, next up, how can technology benefit the teacher? Uh, if you post something once, it is available for everyone to see at any time, at any time. And so you don't have to make an announcement to each individual student. You can make one announcement online, tell them all to check, right? Or you can uh, make one correction online, tell them all to do it. You can put one, uh, I don't know, worksheet online, and you don't got to print them out. You can just put it online, and they can do it. Um, and so you post something once, it's available for everyone to see at any time. Uh, and that's any time, right? So they can be in study hall and they can do it. They don't got to come up to you and ask for it again. Uh, they can just, you know, read what's on the study hall. Or they can be absent and do it from home. Uh, or they can be, um, uh, do something for homework. And so there's lots of uh, reasons why that's important to do it at any time. Uh, I mean, they got downtime, they want to do it at lunch, for example, or um, study hall. Um, so, you know, lots of time. Anyways, administrators love to see it. Uh, it's incorporation. Uh, administrators are going to love to see technology. They absolutely crave it uh, from their teachers. And, you know, oftentimes it's one of the standards on a, a teacher performance rubric. And so you want to be uh, using technology uh, so that way you can foster some of these technical skills uh, for your students, right? Which is obviously important like we talked about. And so they love to see its incorporation. If you're not using it, um, it might not necessarily look bad on you, but you want to hedge your bets here, right? What are you going to do? You're going to you use more technology than not. And again, it's beneficial to the students too, which is the ultimate uh, goal. Uh, next up, we got artificial intelligence can help create questions and worksheets to provide students. And uh, so we'll look at a sample worksheet uh, created by artificial intelligence. And it's pretty cool. Um, it's shockingly easy um, and, uh, to make worksheets uh, using artificial intelligence. And um, I bet you it's probably most helpful for like math and, and uh, ELA, so English language arts. Uh, than it is for like history or uh, science. Uh, at least that's what I find. Um, but you know you can uh, you can do that for these two subjects, which is important because you know math and reading or, or math and ELA are the only two subjects that are practically tested nowadays. And so one of the things that happened with uh, well, God, state testing in general is that ELA and math are pushed to the forefront, and uh, science and social studies were pushed. Uh, to the wayside, right? Nobody, nobody cares about them anymore, and uh, which is shocking to me because I think that that science and uh, social studies are the most important uh, subjects in, well, all of our curriculum for that matter. Uh, but turns out nobody thinks that way in education. So the people who make these uh, standards and tests and whatnot, they don't care about social studies. They don't care about science. They only, all they care about is ELA and math. And so. Um, you know, my opinion doesn't necessarily matter on that, even though they're my favorite. And I also think they're the most important, and that's just like from an objective standpoint, I think that they're important, right? Um, even though I guess it's technically subjective. Um, anyways, uh, artificial intelligence can help you create these worksheets. Pretty cool. Um, really helpful for ELA, and we'll show you here in a second. And then uh, obviously fact check everything, right? But it is a cutting edge tool. And so if you are going to use artificial intelligence, sometimes it's wrong. Um, or sometimes it comes up with things that are so obscure that you're like, there's no reason that it should be a question in an in, in assessment, for example. Um, but, you know, like, I'll give you an example. Like, one of the things I did was uh, we had a, like a fun movie day. And I can't remember what, what day it was. They just finished state testing, I think. And we all had the classes together. And we, did, um, we watched the movie Aladdin. And uh, we wanted to just have, you know, so that way they're not messing around. We want to have a little worksheet, right? And so we pop our uh, little quiz. So you popped up a quiz on um, ChatGPT, uh, quickly made some questions and uh, answers. And uh, well, the ChatGPT created 10 questions, right? But like three or four of them 
were completely irrelevant to the movie. They were, they were relevant to the movie, right? But it was about the production of the movie. So like, who came up with the script of the movie? Um, or like, what was this uh, actor's name? And you're like, yes, it's relatable. It's related, but it's not, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't about the movie's plot itself and like what happened and, and some of its characters. And so, um, you know, you, you got to fact check these things um, before you, you give it to the students. And so uh, that's something to take into consideration. So plan ahead a little bit. Anyways, uh, examples of technology-based instruction. Uh, you got Microsoft Suite. Uh, you got video production, uh, music production, uh, games, uh, Nearpod. Nearpod's pretty cool. So, uh, we, like, you obviously, guys, you guys know the first three, right? But we'll talk about our, the first four, but we'll talk about Nearpod. Nearpod is the software that allows you to take a PowerPoint presentation, right, and then uh, you put it into Nearpod, and then you can provide little um, uh, knowledge checks throughout the way. And so students have to engage with the PowerPoint online, right, in order to progress through it. And um, it's a great way to gauge student understanding. So you're formatively assessing their understanding, right, which is extremely important, like we talked about last week, or last, last uh, lecture. And um, so you're formally assessing, then you can use that data to either you know, clarify things um, or move forward, um, or backwards for that matter. Uh, so Nearpod, uh, translation software, you're going to be using this all the time, right? So I taught at a bilingual school for uh, two years. And um, you know, at this bilingual school, you had... I think it's like 40% of your students were, uh, you know, bilingual or just, or I don't even know if they're bilingual, but they were English language learners. Uh, and so they either, maybe they were, but just bilingual. And so not everyone was an English language learner, but, you know, they may as well be considered that because, they, you know, they speak only Spanish at home, right, but they, they come to uh, school and then they speak English. And so it's like, well, you know, obviously there's, they're not as, they're not engaging with, English as much as some other kids are, and they're going to be at a disadvantage. And so um, how can you try to help them along uh, if they're not understanding something? Well, translation software is a great one. So Google Translate, you're not understanding a word. And now this is more so obviously for like intense uh, situations that people don't know anything um, to use translation software. So it works for anybody, right? Um, so translation software, very important. Uh, and that's, you know, you can think about that going hand in hand with a search engine or an online dictionary. And so if somebody doesn't know a word, um, bilingual, monolingual, whatever they are, trilingual, right? Maybe they're polyglot. Um, they can look up these words and they can expand their vocabulary. And so just a very helpful tool. Um, but one translation software I do want to mention before we move on is, uh, it's called Immersive Reader. And I believe it's on PowerPoint, that, or it's on Word. And uh, you can basically pull it up and it translates documents in real time for students. And so uh, if you're, you can follow along uh, the worksheet uh, and, just, and just hear it out, uh, you can hear it um, as it's, um, you know, reading it out to you in the language that you're fluent in. And so very important. It helps students learn because think about how difficult it would be. Uh, you come to the country, you don't speak any English. And uh, now you're expected to, let's say, do work at like an eighth grade level. It's like you don't even speak the language at a kindergarten level and you want to do work at an eighth grade level. It's like that's just not possible, right? And so um, I think that uh, language acquisition should be very, very um, it should be very structured uh, in schools, right? It should really be focused on just acquiring the language for like the first year or two, right? Um, before they even get the, uh, before they even start to learn anything. I mean, like you can learn things, right? And like try to teach them the language as they learn. Um, but it's just, you know, it's a very daunting process. And so um, anything you can do to help those students out is vital. And, um, you know, they don't get an exception on state tests, right? And so if you got a student who just comes in there and speak the language, it's like, look, they're going to fail the state test, right? Because that's, that's what's going to happen, right? Unless they, it's like math, maybe they do good on math. But, you know, all the other subjects, they're going to fail because uh, they don't speak the language, right? So why should they pass, right? So don't think that they can pass. It's like, no. So let's be realistic here. Um, they don't speak the language at all. They don't even know what the questions say. It's like no different than you go to, go to China, right? And you have to answer questions in Mandarin, right? Like, yeah, even if you're smart at a PhD level in like, I don't know, English or something, you got a, you got a PhD in English literature, right, and, um, or, or, or just literature in general, right, and then you go to China, you're taking a, a, a fourth grade test on, a, on something, you don't speak any Mandarin, you're not going to, you can't read Mandarin, right, you're not going to pass the test, you're going to get an F even though you're, you're a doctor, right, and so, you know, think about it that way, how difficult it would be, and so, um, 
you know, it's expect that uh, you got to do all you can for these students, right? Because um, they are facing that uh, big barrier right away. And so anything that you can do to help is beneficial. So translation is huge. Um, or even just directions that you can translate sometimes, right? So just quickly put it in Google uh, Translate, boom. Uh, have them, they can do it right away and save them some time. Um, or you can just have them do it themselves, right? So they got to get used to it. But you got to make sure that they are doing it, though. So you got to come up to them, right, in their proximity, right, to work them through the process. So that way you make sure that they're actually doing things, they can understand it, and they can learn. So it takes a lot of motivation. They have to work twice as hard as everybody else, more than twice as hard as everybody else, just so they can even, you know, do the work, right? And so, well, there's that. Uh, website building is pretty cool. Um, so you can get them acquainted with building a website. Uh, there's lots of softwares to do that. Uh, Wix.com is a good one. Uh, or just, I think even Google has one where you can make just little websites. And so that's pretty fun. Um, it's a fun little project. Why not? You can share things. And just get them some technical skills, you know, uh, that they can maybe use, right? And think of, like, why is that important, right? You think, why? Well, nobody's going to be building websites, right, when they're, when they're uh, going into the job market. So that's very few people. It's like, yes, but a lot of people might be small business owners, for example. Maybe they want to have a, a lawn mowing business. And so they make a website um, with all their prices and some of the works that they've done. So like an online portfolio in some regards. And then uh, they got their number there. They got their email there. And so people can reach out to them at any time and, uh, you know, get their services. And so um, you can also put their schedule on there, too. So say, look, we only mow from 8 a.m. to, uh, you know, 4 p.m. Or, or, you know, 9 a.m. to, you know, 7 p.m. or city ordinances for whatever. And so, um, well, it would be nice to have a website. Right? And you don't want to pay somebody you know, a few hundred dollars to do that for you. You can save a few hundred bucks by learning how to do it in school. And so uh, very useful there. Uh, sharing of materials. Uh, so they can email things or they can use Google Drive. Uh, they can use PowerPoint. And so they can uh, you know, go back and forth and um, you know, trade information, communicate findings. Uh, personalized learning programs. Uh, so you have things like iReady software. So software that... Um, does a diagnostic screening assessment of the students, and then they can gauge their performance level or their um, ac current academic level for whatever subject or current understanding. And then it can give them questions uh, that are aligned with their understanding and slightly above. And what happens is you're trying to, it's trying to teach you and push the envelope uh, forward so that way if you start at like a third grade level and you're in sixth grade, it's like, well, then it's going to give you third grade questions, and once you master that, you're going to go on to fourth grade questions. And once you master that, then you're going to fifth grade questions, right? Because it doesn't make sense to give somebody sixth grade questions because they're not, if they're at a third grade level, then they can't do the sixth grade questions because they don't even know third grade math, right? And so um, they haven't even mastered third grade math. How are they going to do sixth grade questions? Right? Think about it, right? It's very difficult to do uh, math without having like a nice foundation. And so uh, anyways, personalized learning programs, very, very nice that you can use. Uh, a lot of schools nowadays are having students do that all the time. Right, where they got to have so many minutes into these personalized learning programs to uh, you know, foster their growth for math and uh, ELA. Uh, next up, we got learning management systems. Learning management systems are very uh, cool. Again, you can upload all of your stuff to them. And uh, <coughs> ah, bless me. You can upload all of your stuff to them, and uh, students can uh, find them and do a number of different things with them. Uh, discussion posts are pretty cool, so you can have a, a conversation, like a I guess really a class discussion is what it is, but it's online. And so they get familiarized with typing and, and maybe the research process a little bit, as well as uh, expressing their opinions on, on things. And so um, Google Drive is next. Uh, so they, again, sharing information, um, storing information, uh, retrieving it, uh, typing practice. So you want them to be able to type nice and fast. Audiobooks. Audiobooks is great. I love audiobooks. And so here's the interesting thing. Uh, about the literature, audiobooks don't aren't actually beneficial to students. They're actually uh, standalone. They're actually a detriment to student learning. And so, if you're ever just going to give somebody an audiobook and that's it, really, really bad. But if you pair an audiobook with text, then it becomes more beneficial. And um, you're going to see a lot of, of uh, benefit in terms of like your ELL students. Um, you're going to see a lot of benefit uh, from your um, uh, from your a. Uh, uh, just general learning, learners in general, too, because they can see the grammar uh, behind the, uh, the, the text, right? And so they don't got to guess about how to spell things. They don't have to guess about where the periods are. They don't have to guess about where the commas are at. They have to guess about indenting or what the paragraph is. And so uh, very nice, or how to spell a name for that matter. Uh, so audiobooks are really good if you're already like a very fluent reader. So then it's fine. Right? But if you're somebody who's a learner, 
right, and you haven't even mastered your own language yet, well, then you should probably be using a text and an audio book. Right? That's the best method. Um, and also another thing that's pretty interesting too is let's say you're doing this in like a documentary, for example. There's more technology, right? There are documentaries. Um, or you can take the captions and just put those on. And it just helps students see it um, as well as hear it. And, um, but they can, they can see the, the words too that are going along with the pictures and whatnot. So um, you're getting some nice word association there, um, both in terms of audio visual. Um, and that's, that's a good thing. So, uh, you know, captions. Right, audiobooks, and you also got to get PDFs too into the mix. And so, uh, PDFs are very important. They can learn how to create those, uh, learn how to edit them, and uh, also learn how to send them, and download them, and save them to their own computer. Uh, next up, we got news articles. Uh, so students can, well, obviously you want them to become acquainted with current events, and that's more so uh, concerned with uh, history and social studies. Um, but it could be for English language arts as well. Maybe you're teaching uh, English and you want to use some current events articles about important things that are going on in the, uh, in the world. Uh, for example, at the time of this recording, there was the uh, Titanic uh, submarine people who were down there looking at the Titanic, and I think like four or five of them just ended up dying uh, because they did not uh, have, well, people lost communication. Nobody knows what happened with them. Uh, but that's a current event. People might be interested in hearing about that. You can have a, a prompt about that. Like, would you ever go down um, and uh, see the Titanic if you knew it was potentially dangerous? Um, or what do you think happened with these individuals? Where did they go? And why do you think that? So you can assess some articles. You can read, like, you know, eight or nine, right? Maybe not that many, right? Because it is, you know, these students still. But uh, maybe they read six articles and they formulate their own opinion on, on the matter. And, um, or maybe they read more than that. Uh, but yeah, next up, uh, using artificial intelligence. So we're going to refer to this Word document here. And uh, this is pretty cool. Right? So I created this using only artificial intelligence. And uh, it's an entire story I titled The Apple Picking Adventure. And yes, um, ChatGPT uh, did actually make the title itself. right? And so how do you use ChatGPT? All you do is you make an account, you sign up, and... Uh, it's free, so you don't got to pay anything. You can pay for a subscription version, um, but you can also use the free, the free one as well. And all you do is you type in a prompt, right? So let's say create a story about uh, people, about four characters who are picking apples, and uh, they go on this uh, adventure, right? And then so it'll it'll start to type up a story right away, right? Like it'll instantly type up the story here. And so you'll get a whole bunch, right? And what you do is, is it'll be pretty basic, right? And you see how short it is. It's only a page and, you know, a quarter or a third maybe. And uh, so what you say next is, okay, so add more detail, right? So once it's finished typing the story, say add more detail and make it longer. So then it'll make the story even longer. And you say add more detail again and make it longer, right? So it adds even more detail and it makes it longer, right? And then you can say, I don't know, maybe add a plot twist, right? And it'll add a plot twist, right? And then you say, make it longer again. Right? Eventually, you'll get a nice little story here. And you can make them longer than this, right? Um, or shorter than this. Um, but it really depends on what you want, right? But you got to tell it what to do. It's like very step by step and, and uh, very, you got to tell it exactly what you want. And so say, hey, I want, a, I want a story about an adventure where people are picking apples. And I want there to be this many characters. And I want it to be this long, uh, even though it probably won't give you the full length of whatever you request. Um, but you're going to have to keep just saying, make it longer, make it longer, make it more detailed, make it more detailed. And once you do that, you'll get a nice story. All right, so once you got the story, what, what then? Right? Well, then you're going to go to reading comprehension questions. So say, uh, create 10 multiple choice questions uh, about the story. And uh, yeah, just create 10 multiple choice questions concerning reading comprehension of the story. Uh, and it'll create 10 multiple choice questions right away. So then you got those. Right, and then say, well, you know what, I want to create some extended response questions too. So then you say, uh, create, uh, I want you to create two extended response questions, right? So let's say one, two, and there you go. So now you got two extended response questions. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then you can even edit these yourselves, right? So I added some power verbs to them, right? So I did uh, describe, I underlined it, explain, underlined it, right? I added uh, analyze, right? So you're just changing it slightly, right? So that way it's mirroring Bloom's taxonomy a little bit more. Uh, and then you got vocabulary words. So say, you know what, ChatGPT, create me 10 vocabulary words and provide their definitions down. Right? 10 vocabulary words that students should know, too. Uh, so say, create 10 vocabulary words that middle school students should know, right? period. 
and uh, also, comma, provide their uh, definitions, period. All right, so they'll do that. Pop out. Boom. Ten vocabulary words, ten uh, definitions to accompany those. All right, and, um, you, know, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it can be easy. Sometimes it can be uh, more difficult words. Um, but, you know, these are very, like, avid's probably a good one. Uh, reservation, right? So you can see it's not perfect, right? Um, it's not giving you maybe the best words every time. Um, it's not uh, always the most complex text, too, so maybe there aren't that many difficult words. Uh, but you can, you can eventually tailor it. So what you would do is you say, well, make it even, make it at a higher reading level, right? So you include more difficult vocabulary, right? And it'll make a story with more difficult vocabulary. And then they'll get some words uh, that you can use vocabulary words that are a little bit more difficult. Uh, and so there's that. All right, so next up you could say, all right, so, uh, so then you could just use something easy. Like say, copy the following vocabulary words into your notebooks or on a separate sheet of paper. So that way they're just copying down. Then you could say, rewrite each of the 10 vocabulary words in your own words. Right, so there's another assignment that they could have there. Right, so not only do they got these, these extended response questions, not only do they got these multiple choice questions, they also got these vocabulary words too that they're engaging with. Um, so we're focused on vocabulary acquisition. And then after that, you could even do the next day, you could have vocabulary words quiz. Right? So they could have to uh, answer questions about these words here and, and pick out their definitions. And it'll create all of this for you like really quickly. And uh, well, I'll, let's cover the next part per, first real quick. So after that, you could say, give me a summary of the story. Right? So you can create your own answer key. So that way you remember what it is um, as time progresses. Right? And then you got 10 multiple choice slash reading comprehension quiz. So it gives you all the, uh, the answer key right here. Uh, D, B, B, C, C, B, 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 A. Right, I think I forgot one B up there. Um, but then it'll give you also the answer too. So you say provide me the uh, answer key to the quiz and provide the answer along with the letter. Right, so then it'll pop out something like this. Right? And then uh, you also got 10 multiple choice of vocabulary quiz. So it'll pop out do the same thing again. Right? You got the, the letter. You also got the answer itself. And uh, so you know, pretty cool. Right? So easy thing for teachers there. Um, but how would you format it? Well, it's not going to come out in this easy format, right, as uh, crisp here. But all you got to do is just go to a Word doc, you know, create a little border, um, and then you want to copy and paste uh, ChatGPT into like a notepad or something on your laptop, right? So you literally just type in like notepad, right? So like note, uh, let's see if I can find it, notepad, right? So you literally just find the notepad app, right, on your, a, um, on your computer. Right, and just copy into there first, and then select it all again, and then put it into a Word document. Otherwise, you're going to have like a weird background uh, to the text. It's going to be one of those fill things you literally cannot get rid of. And so, uh, but then you can just format it accordingly, and this looks really nice and professional. You could even separate it, too, into uh, different worksheets. Right? So you could say, all right, they read the story on, on this first page here, or this first leaf of paper, and then you just hit a bunch of uh, indents until you get down to the next one. So maybe you only got one quiz for the next day. The next day, maybe you do... A, uh, the extended response. And so, you know, pretty cool. Um, but this is all made by AI. And uh, you didn't have to do nearly as much work. Because if you had to make the story yourself, you're going to drive yourself insane. Right? But it's a nice, easy thing. And it's really beneficial for the younger students, too. Uh, it's not as beneficial for the uh, students who are older, especially in high school. Because it's not necessarily at the high school level yet, uh, artificial intelligence. But I think it's a solid middle school level. And uh, hey, maybe the middle school level even works for some high school students. Because again, remember, the average American reads at a fourth grade level. And so not everybody's reading at a high school level, even if they are in high school. And so, um, well, there's that. And even if it's not fourth grade level, maybe, uh, maybe it's gone up or down or whatever. I saw fourth grade, but maybe it's a little bit higher. Even if it's at you know, a seventh grade level, for example. It's like, you got to realize, like, most people are not at, like, they wouldn't be, if they're in high school, they can't read it then still or understand it as effectively. Like they'll understand the majority of it, but they won't understand all of it. And um, if you want, you want to get them to understand everything that they're reading. And so it's just, it's just a matter of reading more, right? acquiring more vocabulary. And uh, part of the way that you can do that is just creating these little stories, getting vocabulary words, getting, uh, assessing them on those vocabulary words um, in whatever manner uh, that allows them to acquire those, those words into their vocabulary. So... Uh, again, pretty cool. Um, lots of things that you can do uh, with technology. Uh, one of the funner areas of uh, discussion, but it's really just a differentiation method um, that you can use in your classroom. So there's you know, no one right or wrong answer. You really got to gauge it for your own students about when you should use it, when you shouldn't use it. 
uh, but just err on the side of using it as much as you can. And so whenever you can, and it's not going to be a potential detriment, then use the technology, um, and it will be beneficial in the future. So, uh, well, with that said, uh, I'm your professor, uh, Ian Phillips. Uh, you can follow me at Ian Phillips USA on social media, all platforms. Um, and then you can also refer back to the timestamps if you want. If you want to refer back to any point in the lecture, they'll all be timestamped below. Uh, next lecture is probably going to be on stakeholder engagement. I think that that's time. It's time. And then we're going to have one on uh, case studies and law. We're going to have one on uh, creating a lesson plan. And then we're also going to have one on uh, then we're also going to have one on student teaching in the job market, which is going to be the best lecture. And so we had, uh, what, three more? Three more, I think, um, in the cards. Maybe we got another one, but I think three more. And so uh, pretty fun, pretty cool. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Bye.